All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for what we hope is another exciting edition of um, a lift off webinars. Today, we have an interesting topic centered on really how to define your, your app growth strategy and KPIs. Joining us today will be a great cross section of performance marketers really up throughout the Americas. Um, and then they'll have a chance to introduce themselves today uh, in just a moment. And then also, Co-moderating will be a good friend of mine and and um, and partner Pedro the Arteaga, who will introduce himself uh, shortly as well. But just to kind of recap briefly, the aim of today's webinar is to really get into a deep conversation around how performance marketers from various verticals define their KPIs, uh, their their north star metric, if you will, how that shifts depending on what stage uh, of company growth they may find themselves in at their respective companies. Um, and you know how these KPIs and the pursuit of these KPIs potentially change from channel to channel. So hopefully, it's a uh, it's a valuable discussion, and um, you know the the audience today is able to pull some great lessons that they'll be able to put into practice um, by the end of the webinar. So without further ado, um, I'd love for each of the panelists and, co and our co-moderator uh, Pedro to turn on their cameras and audio at this moment. I'll give you all a chance to uh, to introduce yourselves. But in addition to introducing yourselves, I'd love if you could also share with us one sort of new hobby or habit, if you will, that maybe you've um, that you've picked up during this time of quarantine that we're all going through, uh, just for to share with the audience and, and give them a, a sense into into your your personal lives. So we'll, we'll go ahead and 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 add that to our introductions uh, as we go around the horn here. Well, Great, so just, thank you, Carl. Go ahead, Vito. All right, so just really quickly introducing myself here. My name is Carl. Um, I'm the, the head of Latin America here at Liftoff, really leading our, 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 our business's growth in, throughout the region, uh, leading a team that's kind of focused on, on sustaining and, and driving that growth and having the opportunity to work with an awesome set of performance marketers uh, and partners in, in the region. Uh, one quick fun fact about myself, a new hobby that I've been picking up, if you will, during this time of quarantine is I've gotten really nerdy about barbecue uh, during this time, watching hours and hours of um, barbecue content on YouTube <laughs> to kind of fine tune that craft. But that's one uh, one thing that I've been doing with this extra time during during quarantine. Uh Thank you, Carl, for the introduction. Welcome everyone to this, uh, well, I um, hope to amazing webinar we're hosting today with this cross section of very strong and seasoned marketeers. I'm Pedro, I'm, I'm the CEO of, at WinClub. For those who don't know WinClub, we are a company, Latin based company expanding to the rest of the Americas. We help our upgrowth teams to grow their businesses through developing different strategies for user acquisition, re-engagement and reactivation. And um, well, if I can, if I want to share a fun fact, I think it's, it should be a little bit embarrassing being concerned that I'm Argentinian, but uh, as Carl, uh, in my case, he was not becoming nerdy by bar about barbecues, but uh, the quarantine was the first time in which in my whole life I made a barbecue by myself. So this is, I can say that being an Argentinian, this is pretty embarrassing, but well, I'm proud of myself because I, don't, I only did one but I did four barbecues uh, in this quarantine. So when things open up and you come back to Buenos Aires or to Cordoba, I will invite you to, to my house to, to host your barbecue. I love this, I love that. Hey folks, uh, I'm Vivek Girotra here, currently leading growth at Elevate Labs. Uh, this is a company that and it focuses on mental fitness and we have an app called elevate which is a brain training app uh, that's you know, been around in the market for a while and also a new meditation app uh, that's been getting really awesome reviews lately uh, so myself i've you know, been in marketing for many years spent some time on the agency side before moving into mobile marketing and you know prior to elevate labs i've 
being at Zeus, which is a dating app, and then spend some time in the trenches at Machine Zone and uh, Fox Next Gaming. Uh, a hobby that I've picked up uh, during this period is actually uh, day trading. It's kind of an expensive hobby right now. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, some call it gambling, but uh, it's it's been very interesting for me to just learn a lot about finance markets, how things move, and uh, I think it's been a one of the more productive things I've done during this time. Pick up a gambling habit. That's nice. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Thank you for the invitation. I'm Martin Veloc. I'm marketing manager for, for Walla. Um, Walla, I'm an economist and previously joining Walla. I, I worked for five years at Google on the, on the sales team. And on September 2017, I joined Walla. Walla is a fintech in Argentina. Uh, it's a mobile app linked to a MasterCard prepaid card that uh, launched in October 2017 to <laughs> revolutionize the personal finances, enabling uh, a lot of people to access for the first time to a mobile and financial solution. Basically, people can download our mobile app, complete a registration process, and if everything is okay, we validate the uh, the access and we send a, mo a, a prepaid MasterCard card to anywhere in Argentina for free that enables uh, everyone above 13 years old uh, with an Argentine ID to uh, buy online on anywhere uh, and on any shop anywhere in the world. And moreover, uh, being able to uh, pay bills, top up the Metro card, top up their mobile uh, prepaid plan, ask for a loan and invest uh, their savings on a, on a mutual fund offering a, a complete and global uh, financial solution for for everyone. Um, and uh, well, as I told you before, we launched in October 2017 and we have issued more than 20 million cards in Argentina, a country of 45 million people uh, and, and really leading the, the, the fintech uh, scenario in, in Argentina. And um, well, on the, on the fun fact that you asked, uh, well, I'm uh, 33 years old and it's been like, I think, 20 years since, since I haven't played uh, online games. And I think as a lot of people on this uh, quarantine uh, entered uh, Steam and all these uh, online sites to, to play games with, with my friends from, from school and, and having a lot of good memories from from the secondary school. I 100% right. agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm pleased to share this webinar with uh, those mar market references. I, I, I know all the companies involved, so uh, I'm privileged <laughs> to be here sharing sharing my my ideas uh my name is gabriel i've been working on the digital industry for over nine years uh i spent most part of my career being on the supply side so i worked at crypto at google at affiliate networks and in the last three years i've been see i've been taking the comfortable seat of being on the client side so uh I use it to work at Rappi and the delivery app, uh, delivering groceries and and restaurants and everything you need. Uh, managing the user acquisition for eight countries in Latin America, growing like 30% month over month and all the impressive numbers of Rappi and, and fast, fast growing startups. And now I'm at Global, Global is a media company, uh, the biggest one in Latin America. Uh, a reference in, in produ producing content. So uh, I'm leading the strategy for the streaming solution. The, the curious case is that uh, the both the both apps that I use it to work for are, are related to quarantine. Like people are using more Rappi and I are using more streaming apps. 
So Global Play is live in Brazil for uh, almost six years, uh, reaching outstanding results. And this year we started our international expansion. And basically the target is to reach Brazilians living outside Brazil. We are talking about a potential target of 3 million people. Uh, and our first, first territory was US. We launched in, in January and are working to, to expand and, and manage all the different uh, challenges considering the industry, considering the pandemic and everything that is, that is going outside. So I think I'm, uh, I'm trying to uh, manage my background being on the supply side and my background being on, on the advertiser side to, to get the most benefit of it. And regarding the quarantine, so I'm in Brazil, so I'm, I, I think I have the worst case from, from all my colleagues, like things are very crazy here. Um, but for me, it's a mix from Vivek and from Carl because I'm, I'm improving my cooking skills and I'm also studying uh, some investments, buying some stocks. I'm not doing day trade yet, but uh, I'm, uh, like stock options and some other stuff. So I'm, I'm studying and maybe we, we never know, might be a quarantine 10 years from now and I expect to be at a more comfortable house, a, a nice apartment, beach view. So let's try to multiplicate our investment. That's it, guys. Okay. Well, right. well, thank you all for, for the introductions. Hopefully our, our guests have a, a sense of, of, of who we're speaking with uh, today in terms of our, our, our awesome panel. Uh, in terms of the audience, I would encourage you all to participate in the discussion as well. Uh, we will be giving away uh, gift cards for the best questions that are read aloud uh, and chosen to be presented to our panelists during the webinar. So. Um, be be or be active. Uh, participate and, and leave a question or two, and maybe okay. just maybe use your question, and you'll be rewarded with a with a gift card. Um, all right. With that being said, let's proceed with our with our first set of questions. Uh, Pedro, do you want to kick us off? Yes, of course. Um, so the, the, the first topic we would like to, to discuss today, it's related to well, what is the, the, the North Star metrics that uh, each of you um, are using for your current user acquisition efforts and how did you go about defining this as your key objective? And we can start with, with you, Vivek, and you can share uh, a little bit about how how do you manage this process and, and also share with the audience how did this does this change from your time in the trenches in machine so on fox next to your current stage at elevate labs where well, as a serious big company i imagine like there's a lot of difference there mm -hmm. right so you know as, as a performance marketing team your north star is always roas that that's a given but the context changes a lot uh, depending on you know, three different things. One is what is really your product. You know, at Machine Zone, uh, it was a, a very deep strategy game that really we were aiming for just a, a, a really high ARPPU, low uh, and then overall low retention audience. Whereas at Fox Next, it was a mid-core game with the Marvel brand name, so it had a wider mass appeal, but the, the average revenue per paying user was much less than compared to a deeper machine zone strategy game. At Elevate, we actually have a completely different model, which is, you know, uh, it's a brain training game. So this kind of is on the borderline of education and gaming. The client, so I think really being able to understand what your product is, whom, who the audience, whom does it speak to is, is really important. Second is the, the monetization model, right? Uh, uh, for example, with Machine Zone, we, you, know, you, could, you could start purchasing things for like $1 and it went all the way to $200, $300. So there was a, uh, along the user journey, you could you know, keep increasing the aggregate LTV curve along the way. Uh, same with FoxNext. So the same, it was similar, but the curve was maybe a little bit flatter. It wasn't as exponential as, as Machine Zone. Uh, because again, these both things again would completely depend on IAPs and no ads. Uh, with Elevate, this is a subscription model. 
So, you know, the modeling is, the financial modeling becomes easier with subscription models, but the you get less of a chance to convert the users because you pretty much uh, have to get a user into a trial and the trial converts to a subscription. So onboarding becomes really much, much more important in an app like this. Uh, and the third one is really the company, you know, where it's at, what stage, what the funding looks like. And you, know, you rightly hinted at that as well. With Machine Zone, you know, we were a well-funded company. We had a really long payback period defined so that we had allowed us to spend a lot more than the competitors. And frankly, we priced out a lot of competition from so many, so many channels. Uh, at Fox, you know, we were supported again by a larger corporation and had the leeway to uh, you know, spend money and uh, you know, make investments, front load our investments in the hope of getting our payback later on in, in the year. Uh, whereas at Elevate, although theoretically I could do the same thing, the you know, cash flow becomes a you know, really important concept for a company like us. So that is something we have to keep in mind uh, while drafting our ROAS metrics. So, uh, you know, we actually leave money on the table right now uh, because we don't want to you know, spend all our money in one go and keep a sustainable uh, revenue generating stream coming through all the time. Yeah. Thank you, Vivek. That, that is really awesome. I think so. Well, uh, you mentioned that you started the year, your answer with context is really, really important uh, here. And in that perspective, I think that well, for you, Martin, since you joined Walla until today, context has changed a lot in terms of the stage of the company. Uh, you mean well, from 2017, I know well I'm very well because I'm merging TN2, so I remember the seed stage last December was the Series C. How can how does this change in context uh, change your 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 North Star metrics for your for your strategy? Yes, uh, since since our launch in the market in, in 2017, we we have grown a lot, as as you have uh, just said uh, last year, we. We raised uh, 150 million dollars on a round led by Tencent and, and SoftBank, um, and uh, our our financial solution uh, since the very beginning. I, I told you about the details of, of our product, and for the users, all uh, all the service that we provide for them is is for free. People can count on on a card, and all the financial solutions offer through the app. Uh, for free, we generate revenue through the interchange fee whenever a, a, a user pays with our card and also with the fees related with the use of the uh, bill payment feature, etc. That, uh, that is not uh, charged uh, on the user and also uh, on the interests of, of our loans. Um, therefore, our our growth and our North Star uh, KPA have also uh, evolved on all this time. At the very beginning in, in 2017, 2018, we were really, really focused on, on growth and, and user acquisition. And uh, we transitioned on, on 2019 and 2020 to, uh, to a move more on, on user activation. Um, but uh, I believe that uh, acquisition and, and activation or, or, or retention are two metrics that are really related and, and and at the very beginning when we were focused on on growth we always uh, have a, a, a look on retention and, and activation because we realized that uh, the results were much better when when we focus on on acquiring valuable users than just uh, any type of users and, and, and then having to 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 spend time and, and strategies and, and and investments on on trying to uh, to increase your retention. Um, so um, I believe that that these two metrics were uh, important since the since the very beginning and, and are our our north. And now uh, that we have uh, evolved a lot more, I think that uh, we are really focused on on 
on on putting a little bit of of complexity on on the on the value and, and activation of the users and and, and and focusing on the lifetime value of being able to to project and analyze uh, the real value that the that the users uh, generate for for our company <clears throat> thank you there it but re remind us to 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 go back again in a couple of minutes to the retention and how this this impacts you in the in the strategy because definitely well we we all agree here that retention um it's key factor to grow the company and also not to well to compete and it's part of the other topic we want to discuss but before we move there i would like to, to to learn from you gabby where also your context changed dramatically in the yeah. last year from within rapid but also from rapid to to global play how this is this is uh, impact your 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 north star metric yeah well, I, well I and we actually we do have like a sky full of stars right for 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 the metric it, it's quite challenging because at the end of the day everything is related to to our capacity to generate revenue so and that impacts for example at, at the fast growing startup as rapi on how fast we grow uh, how fast we increase our market share uh how fast can we expand to new territories and new countries uh but at the end of the day you need to generate more revenue so um, everything at a startup is, goes really fast and, and at a lot of scale and a lot of investments and a lot of changes. So you see, uh, you see the improvements and you see the mistake in a very uh, fast way so we can make the decisions very quickly uh, or to increase uh, your reach and increase your potential or to manage some damage. So, and by changing from a model that is basically like uh, buying groceries and ordering food, uh, I changed it to a subscription service for a streaming app. And in, in my case, it's more specific because um, I'm launching a very competitive landscape. So uh, if you go to the US market, you have all the top reference on the streaming industry. And uh, and I'm working with any, so the, the, the bar is very high. Um, considering like user experience, uh, all the experience within the app and all the streaming solution, uh, but also it's a different uh, business model as well. So I changed it for a purchase model to a subscription model. So uh, we, we do need to generate revenue and this revenue is related to uh, my retention rate uh, because I need to keep the user uh, engaged and consuming my content and keeping being a subscriber. Uh, and I work with niche audience that is also challenging. So for the international expansion of Global Play, we launched it from ground zero. So I have no background or no benchmark on how to understand or calculate and measure and, and, and I, I have no, nothing to compare. So. Of course, we have the numbers from Brazil. We did a lot of research, but at the end of the day, you, you only know when it goes live. So it's quite challenging because I have a seven day trial period and then I need that user to keep the subscription and that subscription must keep uh, generating revenue uh, on, on a lifetime. So uh, it changed a lot, uh, the scale and the business model, uh, but it's uh, as, challenge, as, as challenging as it was. Awesome, thanks for that insight, Gabriel. We'll move on to, to the next main question here. And so digging a little deeper into, you know, how do you how do you set targets for this metric? I think you, each of you has shed some light on what your North Star metric is, you know, for uh, for the various companies that you work with today and have worked with in the past. And that kind of ranged, or that ran the gamut from sort of like ROAS to growth to retention. Now, when, when, when you're actually defining this metric um, for, for your growth efforts, how do you how do you really set a target you know quantitatively for a for a growth metric or a retention metric? But I mean, we'll we'll start with you. I know you, you you shed some light on kind of how the KPIs have evolved from from your end at Uala, from you know starting on a growth oriented sort of mindset, moving over to like more of a retention slash activation mindset. You know, how do you set targets for for metrics that would define whether or not your, your growth efforts are successful against these these shifting sort of North Star metrics. 
Yes. Um, well, I think that some something that that we have always in in mind is uh, ARPU, LTV, and on a company that evolved on growth and where we launched uh, a, a product wo that was uh, simple on 2017, and on on all this time we keep on adding new features like loans, investments, and and our product is is totally live, and we are constantly adding new features that. Uh, tend to bring on new new revenue streams. I think that uh, we have a, a, a strategy on, on both sides on analyzing the relationship between our customer acquisition cost and our lifetime value um, to calculate our, our ROI and combine that with uh, product targets uh, for each of our uh, of our uh, business units so uh, that is something that that uh, has uh, evolved on all this time and and on that side um, something uh, interesting as a as a challenge is the the time that passes between um, the person installs our app and they are and the first activation maybe it's a very different from maybe the, the gaming industry where probably the person uh, can install their mobile app and and maybe play the game and, and monetize on on the very first day uh, people that download our our app uh, complete the registration process and, and get approved on two days and then uh, it takes up to 10 days to, to get your card anywhere in, in Argentina and, and that for sure is a, a challenge or, 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 or maybe something particular of, of our uh, fintech industry compared to, to the gaming uh, that is also uh, very interesting, the, the lag that, that we have on the, on the information. Awesome, thanks, thanks for that Martin. You know, speaking of the gaming industry, Vivek, you've, you've spent um, you know, many years in, in this space at Machine Zone, Foxnext, now at Elevate Labs. Um, how do you think about you know, the, the time it takes for a user to really kind of complete their like LTV journey, if you will, and any sort of intermediate events that, 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 that occur in between sort of the install and that, you know, um, I would say like LTV completion event? How do you how do you think about what events to optimize as sort of early signals when kind of quantifying the quality of new users and whether or not they're on track to become sort of high LTV users for Elevate Labs or you know um, experiences in the past? Yeah. So uh, let, let's start from the beginning, right? So example, if if you have a completely new app, then you are going to have to make some assumptions using comparables in the market about what the one year or two year you know, revenue uh, revenue curve revenue degradation curve looks like and you know, then adopting you know some statistical least curve fitting methodology uh, using either comparable data or past data you come to sort of some targets about where you need to be on a d7 perspective on a, on a d14 perspective and, and, and so on. So that's how you would normally do it for, uh, you know, a game which is primarily dependent on IAP and has, uh, you know, a revenue model that, that increases basically over time. Uh, for a subscription uh, app like us, it's uh, relatively easier because you pretty much have to think about the drop off between install to trial to subscription and then the the renewal rate across year two and three. Uh, so I, I know for, you know, I've been talking to my friends in uh, you know, the meditation category where you know, you've seen a lot of growth lately and that's primarily because a lot of those apps are using two to two and a half year uh, payback periods as you know their, their acquisition goal. So that allows them the leeway to spend and acquire a large volume of users so, you know, so basically you need to kind of backtrack and come to some sort of a baseline. Like, okay, what is the cost per trial, for example, that I need to be at? And once you get that, then you can adopt, you know, some more uh, 
scientific based science, scientific methods to come at events. So uh, currently we're working with Google on, on this project, which you know, they call feature selection. Well, what that does is you feed them all your aggregate data uh, up to D7, and then they will run their ML algorithms and figure out what combination of events is the most correlated to what combination of events in up to D7 is the most correlated to a D30 purchase. And then internally, we can generate a server side event based on that combination and use that as uh, an, an, an event that the buying models can optimize towards. So, so it's really important to kind of figure out what category you need to play in, backtrack to form a baseline and then test and improve from there. So you, you, you've been outsourcing your work to, to Google, I see. Hey, you know, uh, haven't we all? <laughs> no, that's a great point. I mean, often, just uh, anecdotally, often with a lot of performance marketers, it, I think a lot of people struggle with finding sort of like the combination of intermediary events that are great signals for them to optimize towards or the single intermediary event, um, you know, that's gonna be very helpful for them to to optimize towards when they have, you know, so many ones to choose from. And sometimes the answer isn't as simple as, you know, you know, this very specific event because the user experience isn't isn't on rails, if you will, uh, for for some for some marketers. And, you know, it's it, it, the there's really just a large selection of events to choose from. Yeah, so you know, one a, a very simple uh, methodology we've adopted is you know to delay sending off the trial event by a day and basically not send any events for any users who canceled in the first 12 hours. So you know. Oftentimes you sign up for a trial and, and people immediately cancel because they have no intention of actually paying for the product. So those removing those low intent users from the feedback signals that we send back to the algorithms has, I would say, improved our, you know, ROAS by 15 to 20% on average. Guys, um, quick question from, from the audience here, Emiliano Brest uh, has chimed in and mentions, or is, is asking us, you know, do you work with magic numbers? If so, what are their examples and how did you work with them? I'm not sure if anybody here has worked with magic numbers or is familiar with that methodology. Nobody? Okay, well, Emiliano, I tried. <laughs> I tried, but it seems like magic numbers might not be uh, a tactic we've, uh, the, the panel here has has used, unfortunately. Uh, but thank you for the question, Emiliano. How to find out which are the magic numbers? Maybe yeah. there are. There's yeah, an there. let's put on, on Vivek day trade strategies, the magic numbers. <laughs> thank you for the question, Emiliano. And for the rest of you in the audience, if there are any additional questions you'd like, uh, for the for the panel to address, please surface them in the in the question section. Uh, but continuing on, I'll pass it back to to Pedro for our next discussion. Yeah, point. follow follow on in the the discussion. I I want to <clears throat> go back to something you mentioned, Martin. In the in your in your strategy today, you have the challenge of coping with ROI objectives, but also you have product objectives, uh, different products that you're launching all the time. How do you how do you cope or how do you cope with having two different targets at the same time for for your strategy? And also like how does this impact you, your your different prioritization efforts and where you put your, your focus? Yes, uh, I believe that that uh, we have very we offer a, a, a very wide financial financial solution uh, of card payments, loan, investment. And we have very clear our value pro proposition for different types of, of audiences where uh, for some of our audiences and targets, one of our solutions is the best one. And for other audience, uh, they are more uh, prone to use another one. So one thing that we have um, very clear is which is that feature that that leads to, to activation and leads to, to retention and and, and and good growth 
Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that that is our our focus on on being very aware of uh, which is the our value proposition and feature that fit best for for a certain target and try to to track on on that. Uh, so um, that leads to a to a combination of tracking. Uh, a specific uh, performance of a certain product but maybe not for all but for a specific audience uh, and also our growth targets for for each month and this is this is a like qualification it looks like you have very clear the use case for each of the products and who is that client persona that you're trying to reach with each of them uh, this is uh, you you use it from the moment you start your acquisition or this is part more of the activation and reactivation strategies that you use after acquisition took place since the since the user acquisition we have a very uh, wide target audience in in argentina uh, anywhere above 13 years old with an argentine id can have it uh, so uh, our audience is is very very wide so we are uh, we know that for certain targets for certain certain targets uh, some features are more relevant than than for another, so that is our our focus. Always focusing on the on the user and and the value proposition that that we have for them since the very beginning of the of the strategy. That is the their user acquisition, and then uh, maybe focusing on 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 cross selling on on our products. Mm Thank you there. Like and, and Vivek, you mentioned something. I think it's it's pretty interesting for the whole uh, audience. The feature selection project you're running with with, with Google. I think that probably this is impacting a lot how you're how you're defining targets for the for your strategy. Uh, what what can you share like a little bit about the discoveries you have made or or how how this shifted from you started the yeah, the UA efforts at Elevate to today after doing this this project. I don't have results yet. You know, it's just something we've. Uh, first of all, I've been at Elevate for two months, and uh, this is something that was actioned a few weeks ago. So I, I don't really have results on that. You have done a lot then in two months. Uh, sorry. I, so you know, like I said, we. If you're asking about the specific Google project, uh, it's still you know work in progress. I think the way. You know, the way I like to think about undertaking any new new project, you know, especially given you know, we are a lean team, uh, you know, we so and you know we have to kind of keep a few factors in mind. One is really take a very deliberate approach about okay, what is it? And have a clear hypothesis about what is it we are testing. You know, what are, who are the stakeholders? What kind of resources does it entail? Uh, you know, second is really define the constraints of the test and what is the measurement of success how much i willing am i willing to spend to learn this thing and how do i know when this is successful and you know, third is just being really ruthless in our prioritization uh, there are so many things that you know are really things that could move the needle for us but you know that i've pushed them out to either q4 or q1 or next year because there are a lot more things, you know, more, more basic data infrastructure related that I want to fix before I get into them. Yeah. Um, one more, one more question for the audience. I think this is a good one, and um, probably relates more to gaming, with um, with maybe some appeal to to streaming. So Gabby and Vivek, uh, listen up. But here's the question from um, from Oscar Lopez, he's basically asking, how do you avoid being too, pish, too pushy with the monetization strategy, i.e., how do you prioritize generating cash flow versus engagement? So oftentimes, and this is an excellent question, oftentimes with performance marketers or when you're, gen, when you're creating a gaming app, maybe primarily, you, know, you, you, you kind of toe this line between, do I show 100 ads in the first 24 hours or do I dial that back in order to improve retention? And maybe that comes back in the long term. Uh, Vivek, you probably have yeah. some hands-on experience with this, uh, or really any of our panelists. Anybody want to give this a shot for for Oscar here? Yeah, like if you check um, 
like I did some research regarding like, for example, US markets, and now we see some brands working with some uh, premium version of their uh, their experience, right? So the subscription price uh, with just a few ads, it, it's a lower price than like the no ads experience. So I think the industry is trying to, to understand uh, how to be pushy because like in my case, I have a seven, a seven day trial period. So I, I must convert that user, but I also have some free content as well to keep the user within my, my, uh, within my platform. So, uh, uh, it's really hard to find the, the fair balance between, uh, between that. And I think it's also related to, to the business model and the buying cycle you have on your, on your, on your product as well. So in, in my case, I have a free platform, uh, uh, and you can do the subscription. So, um, and of course it, it, it comes very annoying. Like for example, Spotify experience, uh, the free Spotify experience is it's a nightmare. Uh, YouTube is moving to the premium feature. And you have these other uh, products uh, having this balanced one. So you can uh, have just a few ads with a, a smaller price or you can have the full experience. So I think the industry is struggling to find this right balance and it depends a lot on your product and on the volume on your user uh, and your buying cycle. So, uh, but for us, it, it, it's working having like a seven day try period, like it's fair with the user so he can understand and have the, the full experience. And if he decides to become a subscriber, uh, he's able to do that. So uh, I, I think uh, it's it's under construction, the, this fair balance. Yeah, I think one more point I want to add is uh, a lot of this, you know, flows top down from management. You know, what is the approach that they take towards growth? Is it more geared towards, you know, short term quarterly, revenue goals or is it a long-term sustainable strategy? You know, one of the reasons that the you know, machine zone sort of, you know, faded away was that you know, we, I think overall from a monetization standpoint, we got really greedy where, you know, basically uh, the, we introduced so many different sales and offers and, you know, inflated the economy to such a point that, you know, if you had, one trillion goal, like it didn't mean anything. So, you know, a new user would come into the game and see, you know, users with you know, 5 million gold points and you know, 10 million hero awards, and they would in get intimidated immediately and, and turn out. So that really harmed us in terms of our, uh, you know, getting new users onto the bandwagon. And eventually it became this game that is just now, you know, being played amongst this core group of 10,000 users and they're still actually the ones driving the game. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, at, at our current company, we're taking a more balanced view. So like Gabriel, we also have a seven day trial. So trying to approach uh, by uh, giving them access to, you know, to previews of our, our best content, but no, also not so much that they can exhaust everything within the first seven days so they have reason to come back and, and pay the premium to access the full package. Great points. No, thank you both for, for your perspective there. Oh, Scott, I hope that's that's helpful. Um, getting back to the main discussion, I wanted to, for the, for the, for the purpose of the discussion today, kind of move the conversation towards testing new channels. I think we're all aware of the importance of having a a diverse sort of growth stack, really, um, yeah. you know, leverage Google, Facebook, and, and those kind of pillars, but also, but also looking at you know other other channels, other sources of inventory like programmatic, search, social, what have you. Um, when you're when you're investigating these different these different channels, really kind of approaching to test these new channels, uh, what, what is your approach? Do you do you shift your KPIs in any kind of way? Do you kind of reorient for say search versus programmatic because you know you, you can expect a different uh, sort of CPI for example? Gabby, I wanted to start with you. Um, any any perspective yeah. you can share with us uh, on on this item? 
Well, uh, my background as vendor makes me enthusiastic of having uh, a very well balanced media plan. Uh, I totally agree. I think like it's it's a common point to everyone. Like we must explore and test and learn. It, it requires a lot of efforts because like uh, you need to filter all the all the inbounds and all the incomes and all the sales feeds and all the endless sales decks we receive. But but it's also the way you can have a fair balanced. Uh, uh, you can have a fair balanced uh, media strategy and it does not depend on one or two sources. Uh, I think this is healthy for the market, it's healthy for the business and for the advertiser. So uh, the question is how, how you can do that? So, uh, uh, well, it's not a fair answer, but like it, it depends uh, at, at the company with the size of Rappi, uh, I, I was responsible for eight countries with different competitive landscapes, with, with different expertises, with suppliers of an expertise uh, for Mexico, uh, with specific suppliers for Brazil. So I need to have this uh, this open view uh, to build this strategy. And for global play, uh, in my case, for example, um, I work with niche audience. So I'm targeting Brazilians living in the US. And I can't do that by like, I can't. I can't buy programmatically if that is not very accurate because I can't spend a lot of money first because like uh, I, spending in dollars like comparing to Brazil it's a lot of money uh, and second because if I'm not accurate like if I'm targeting uh, Americans if I'm competing with Netflix for example that makes absolutely no sense so now I'm, I'm checking with the providers their capability of targeting my specific audience. Uh, and this is challenging for machine learning, for example, for, for Google AC, that is challenging as well because you need to uh, uh, put all the inputs uh, and uh, I need to set, for example, uh, first we, I did a test with Google AC targeting Portuguese and targeting English devices and betting on the machine learning um, evolution to understand and target the right users. But what happened was I generated a lot of installs and no actions because I was targeting Americans. So now, from my perspective, I'm trying to find the right sources with the right capabilities uh, to target my niche audience. And that covers, for example, Apple search strategy and even for Apple search uh, by, uh, by setting the keywords I'm, I'm, I'm bidding for, uh, I must have feeling to bid only for keywords that Brazilians would look for. So I'm not beating competitors, I'm beating uh, Brazilian content, I'm beating my own, beating my own brand. So I'm I'm doing this kind of optimization, and like you don't see in the market a lot of providers with that capability. Like a lot of like, uh, if you have a very well known brand, they just spread ads everywhere, and the result becomes somehow. Uh, but that's not my case. I must be very accurate on my my target. So now, uh, basically, I work with the provider capability to do that targeting. And of course, we allocate a dedicated budget. We certificate uh, that we're measuring that properly and how that impacts on the funnel. And uh, and that's basically uh, what I'm trying to do. Awesome. Thank you for that, um, Gabby. Vivek, just briefly, I wanted to tap you as well. I know you probably tested maybe dozens and dozens of different channels and partners. Sort of what's your approach at a high level when testing new channels, new partners? How, if at all, do you shift your KPIs uh, in order to evaluate those, uh, the fit of those uh, partners into your growth stack? Um, so, so there are you know, three primary filters I look at you know, in testing any new channel. One is, what is the value add, right? Does this, uh, is this channel, like is, is this a gatekeeper to some sort of inventory or do they offer some sort of a, a technical layer that can add some sort of value to how I can reach users? Uh, the second is the scale, right? Like, you know, if, if a channel is a long tail publisher that can get me about hundred odd installs a day, it's honestly just not worth the effort to reward ratio for us to kind of, you know, take on the overhead of managing a channel like that so scale is extremely important to us and especially as a company we're in 2020 looking to double our revenue from last year so we have very really ambitious targets you know and we need partners who can 
help us uh, scale up accordingly. Uh, and the third one I would say is you know, technical sophistication. I think you know, partners that have reporting APIs uh, you know, that can integrate with our dashboards, with our MMPs, uh, they will always have an edge in terms of uh, us choosing to work with them because it just makes things so much easier for us in order to uh, you know, integrate everything into our dashboards and have it feed into uh, all the data sets that we look at every day anyway. <clears throat> Thank you, Vivek. To close, uh, to close, to close the the the, the, the Q and A from this side, and before we move to to answer more questions from the audience, uh, I would like to close with going back to you, Martina, and what you mentioned at the beginning. I promise that we're going back to retention and activation. You mentioned there, you know, you were always had in mind and I'm in place some activation loops and retention loops. Uh, can you share a little bit about how how was how did you put those in place at the beginning uh, when you started? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yes, and, and let me comment something on 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 the last question related to to diversification that I think it's it's key and 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 in terms of the of the KPI, I think that the, that the KPI for the different media for us is is always the same. The thing is that maybe you can be a little bit more flexible on the results on on a certain KPI for for new media that you add to your to your media mix with this objective of of diversification um, that Carl pointed uh, before. I think that that is uh, key. And when analyzing this diversification, I, I totally agree with with Vivek in terms of of watching the 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 quality of the media that you are adding to your mix and the and the potential uh, of growth and and the ability to to become uh, one more uh, one media more on on your set of of media sources and and adapt to your to your strategy and not having to uh, totally change your strategy for for this new for this new media so um I think that you must uh, uh, leave room for for test and learn and have a diversification as a as a north star on the media and also on 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 Google and, and Facebook. Maybe sometimes we put uh, Google or or Facebook on on at the same level, but inside those media you can have diversifications in terms of platforms, YouTube, search, display formats. Uh, Etc. I think uh, diversification is uh, uh, a KPI for for itself inside media and across uh, media. So um, also answering your question in terms for for, for retention, I think that as I told you before, um, user acquisition and and retention, I think that cannot be uh, separated. They are both parts, both sides of the of the same coin uh, it's not uh, it I, I believe it's not a good strategy of, of thinking uh, a strategy for user acquisition and another strategy for user retention or having uh, separate teams that uh, that focus on on these two strategies I think that the that the north star for for a company is trying to uh, match the the value proposition uh, it has with the the users and and that is uh, achieved when when you think on on the long term and trying to to really uh, show an ad for going to the most basic thing to the to the person that uh, it's more likely to to become a, a user or, or a client for for a long time. Well said. Okay, well, with the final five minutes that we have, or just about, we definitely wanted to open up to the the audience here. I see there's some questions lined up. So go ahead and kind of try to get to these as, as, as quickly as we can. We'll try to briefly address them and maybe we'll get through a couple, in, uh, the couple of minutes that we have left here. Um, but let me see, this is a bit of a dense question from Samuel Balcon asking, I'll try to read it out loud here. 
says target audiences value proposition or product slash service differentiation based marketing strategy and tactics. Uh, what works best or is Facebook ad campaign zip code option under location targeting still the primary play? Um, so that's a lot. I think basically what someone is asking here is, you know, is, is there, are there better alternatives to, to, for performance marketing um, when looking at, you know, a Facebook ad campaign and its levers to kind of go hyper local, you know, target, use all, all the levers that Facebook has, has at, at, at their disposal. Um, you know, is that, is that basically the bread and butter play or are there other methods or other, other sort of, um, uh, products or services that we can use as performance marketers instead of, you know, Facebook, anyone's worth considering. Uh, well, uh, for example, in a business like Rappi, what's very useful to promote, uh, use a promote strategy uh, within the coverage area. So user location target, like zip code, like I, I must promote where I have coverage, otherwise I'm, I'm wasting my money. So it depends a lot on, on the product and actually on the target you need to reach. So uh, if you're a digital product that it doesn't matter where you are, uh, you, you can do a broad uh, targeting. If you need to target a, like a niche audience, I need to find solutions that can uh, be related to my content or to to my language or to something like that or to, or to my device. So like for, for, this, for a delivery service like Rappi, it makes sense for you, you. You can do some location, you can use zip code and you can uh, cross that with your covert area. So it depends on, actually it depends on what, why and uh, why do you need to target that audience? Like why do you need to segmentate and, and then get more from that? So I, I would go that way. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'll give I'll give the audience just another second here. It looks like we've tapped most of our questions, but definitely want to give the opportunity to add any final ones before we we wrap up. So I'll give it just another couple of seconds uh, to see if there's any late submissions. And it looks like there aren't going to be. Um, so with that being said, I wanted to give a huge thanks to to my co-host today, Pedro. Our panelists, Gabriel, Martin, Vivek, thank you all so much uh, for your participation today and bestowing upon our audience your wisdom uh, around KPIs and, and how you know how we how we navigate that as performance marketers. Uh, time well spent, and looking forward to the next one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. For thank you, everyone.